Greetings folks. Today we're going to talk about active filters with our op amps. Okay, first things first, different kinds of filters. If we were to plot a response curve, frequency versus decibel gain, we find four different kinds of plots. The first one would be a low pass filter. In other words, it allows low, uh, low frequencies through, passes those, high frequencies are rejected. Then we have sort of the logical inverse of this, which is going to look like this. All right, so this is a high pass, high frequencies through, low frequencies rejected. Then sort of a combo of these two. We have a bandpass filter. So it allows a range of frequencies, gets rid of stuff on either end, higher or lower. And finally, the inverse of that, which looks kind of like this. And that's a notch filter, also known as a band reject. All right, so it keeps everything except what's right there in the center. So we can define sort of three regions, if you will. A pass band, a stop band, and then the area in between, the transition band, where we get some attenuation, but, you know, maybe not a ton of attenuation. So how do we make these things? Well, we can, with passive components, do something like this. Here's our signal source. Maybe I want to make a, uh, a low-pass filter. I can use an inductor and a capacitor. So here's what's going to happen. Really low frequencies. X sub C is huge. X sub L is small. As a voltage divider, virtually all of the input gets to the output. At very high frequencies, the exact opposite occurs. X sub L is big, X sub C is small. We see a lot of attenuation at high frequencies. All right, so that's a passive network. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use an active filter. We're going to use an op amp. Okay, now an active filter has certain advantages over these passives. There are some downsides. So what are the good things? Well, we have impedance control. Now, having control of the pedants does certain things for us. For example, we'll be able to cascade a series of these networks together to make very complicated uh, responses, and there's little interaction between them. Whereas if we had passives, what we find is, if I had another inductor capacitor out here, that would load the first stage, and there would be this interaction, which with the active filters, we don't really have that, so it's... It's a lot easier to design these things. We can have a nice high input impedance and a low output impedance and, you know, good voltage control kind of um, scenario. That's nice. The other thing is no insertion loss. So with passives, there's always going to be some signal lost. You know, there's going to be resistive elements in here. Active filters, there is no insertion loss. In other words, this can be 0 dB exactly right here. Or we can even design it, uh, design it with gain. Okay, that's a, that's a nice little plus. A huge plus is no inductors. Inductors are the least ideal of the components that we have, right, between resistors and capacitors. So, you know, not using inductors is a good thing. Another plus is we have modest component sizes. especially at low frequencies. Normally at low frequencies and passives, you need large values, large capacitor values, for example. Uh, that won't be the case with active filters. On the downside, well, this does need DC. Right, you have to have power. But in most systems, you know, you have power for other things, so you can just kind of piggyback on that. Um, you have limited high frequency capability because that's limited by the op amp. 
So you're not going to be making microwave filters with this. All right. Um, another one is limited power uh, capacity. That's limited by the output of the op amp. So a classic example of a passive um, filter situation would be the crossover in a home loudspeaker. So you drive the low frequencies to the woofer and the high frequencies to the tweeter. Um, you know, you could be pumping 50, 100, 200 watts into the loudspeaker. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to do that with a little active filter. In uh, high end applications and PA systems and studio systems, we might use an active crossover network where we actually split the frequencies at a low level. In other words, if, we, if it was a two way system or for tweeter, then we would have separate power amplifiers for the woofer and the tweeter. That's a, another way of doing it. Um, a little bit more than is really called for in the average home system though. Okay, so this kind of gives us an idea of you know where we're going to be heading here with our active filter, why we want to do it. Lots of applications where I'd rather use active filters than, than use passives. So beyond the basic course shape, what else do we know? Well, I'm going to use the low pass to illustrate this, but this would be true for the high pass and as well for the uh, the band reject and the band pass. One thing I want to know is just how steep that transition range is. So I'm going to put my zero dB, my my pass band here section a little bit lower so you can see it. Does it go like this? Does it go like that? Does it go like that, right? A very steep slope, modest slope, very shallow slope. This we refer to in terms of the order of the filter. First order, second order, third order, third, fourth, fifth order, whatever. Order indicates a couple of things. First thing is it tells you the minimum number of reactive components you need to realize the filter. So a second order filter needs two components. If it was passive, it would need a capacitor and an inductor. And an active filter, that could be two capacitors, right? So a fifth order filter, active filter, would need five capacitors. It's the minimum number you need. It also tells you what the ultimate roll-off slope here is, which would be N, the order, times 6 dB per octave, or N times 20 dB per decade. So if it's a second order filter, let's say the black here is second order, that means it's going to roll off at 12 dB per octave or 40 dB per decade. You know, if the green is, uh, you know, by comparison, a fifth order filter, then that slope would be 30 decibels per octave or 100 decibels per decade. So you're basically narrowing up the transition region that we mentioned. There's no reason to have this steeper than it needs to be, though, right? Because you're just going to make a more complicated, more expensive filter. Okay. Another thing we care about is the precise shape of this. So we might have something that uh, is very smooth. You know, it kind of goes like this. Very well controlled. We might have something that is a much more... Uh, sort of pokey kind of slope. Ultimately, it falls off at the same rate. This green one might have linear phase, which would be good for pulses. Or we might have something that's um, initially rolls off a little bit faster, but you know, maybe we have some like ripples here in the passband. So ultimately, these three are all going to have the same slope, but you know, we can see that the transition region for the blue one is a little bit quicker, but you're paying for it because you have some ripples in the passband. Now these each have their own names. The black version here is a, I'm describing what's called a Butterworth alignment. All right, so the term I like is alignment. But basically this refers to the damping of the filter. And typically for damping we use alpha. Damping is uh, 1 over Q. 
If you remember Q from resonant circuits, AC circuits, it's basically one over Q, right? Um, the other two that we have, the green, this might be a vessel alignment. This is a linear phase, so it's really nice for, like I said, pulses. And the blue here could be a Chevy Chev. I'll just kind of squeeze that in. There's uh, actually a series of different Chevy Chevs that you might um, use. 1 dB ripple, 2 dB ripple, 3 dB ripple, half dB ripple. And they'll all change here a little bit on the, on the steepness end of this. So what ends up happening is these uh, curves also have a, um, a change in the time domain. If you were to look at a square pulse, uh, you know, ideally you have a nice square pulse in time. It does this, you know, a nice step response. Your um, vessel is going to give you a nice response here. It's kind of smoothed out. So it looks good in time. The Chevy Chev will have a very fast rise and fall time, but it's going to ring. It's going to do something like this. And then the Butterworth is kind of in the middle. So depending on what you want to do, and if you want a really nice pulse shape, you might go with a linear phase, like a Bessel alignment. If you really need a fast roll off, then you might go with the Chevy Chev and sort of pay for it with the ringing. But to be honest, unless you have a really good reason to do otherwise, stick with the Butterworth. It's a good general purpose alignment. It works really well. Okay. All you have to do is just look up the appropriate damping for that particular thing. Now, those numbers change depending on the order. You know, the damping of a Butterworth. You know, for a second order is not the same as it is for a, uh, a third, fourth, fifth, sixth order uh, system. Okay. How do we actually build these things, right? How do we make these things? Here's a good question for you. Well, the way we approach this with our active filters is through the use of a template. It's kind of like a, um, kind of like following a recipe. And there's one equation you really need to remember, which is that, you know, critical frequency is equal to one over two pi RC. Remember that from AC circuits. We're going to make a lot of use of that. So what we basically do is we find the kind of uh, circuit we're interested in. Is it low pass? Is it band pass? High pass? What is it? Where do I need it tuned to? In other words, what is the 3 dB down frequency? So you know, my low pass here, I'm going to say, okay, there it is. There's my F3 dB down, or half power point. Okay, That's how I'm going to... Um, define that. Then I say, okay, it's a low pass, you know, with uh, 500 hertz or, you know, two kilohertz or whatever the heck it is. It's second order or fifth order. All depends on how steep I need it, how much attenuation do I need? And that will depend on my application, obviously. And then finally, what's the damping? What's the alignment? So a full description might be to say, well, I need a one kilohertz low pass, second order, Butterworth filter. That's what I need. Okay, now I have to design it. So what we do is we look for templates and the text is filled with templates. So you get out your textbook and just as a quick example here, right? here is one of them. And if you look at this, you'll notice there's maybe some odd bits to it in that these resistors are one ohm and these capacitors are one farad. Seems a little strange, right? Um, and it gives a critical frequency of one radian per second. Like, what the heck is that? Well, we're basically going to do a sort of a three-step process. Step one is, you know, we find the template. Step two is we do a frequency scale. Basically, we're going to use this equation. And then step three is we do an impedance scale to get reasonable sized values. OK, so let's say I want to make a 200 hertz. Right, that's my F3, a 200 hertz high pass filter. OK, so it's going to look like this, second order. 
and I want to use a Butterworth alignment. So there's my complete sort of description. So the first thing I do is I go through and I find an appropriate template. And there are actually multiple templates to do something like this. Um, but I'm just going to pull one out, and it looks like this. Got a couple of capacitors over here. Here's my op amp. This is built on a series parallel design, right? So forget the caps for a sec. You just have basically a series parallel, you know, non-inverting amplifier over here. And then there are a couple of tuning resistors to go along with the tuning capacitors. Okay, so you can th think of this as like two separate things. So here's your series parallel amplifier. And then these four components over here are going to be used to set the critical frequency, right? The F3. All right. If you look on the template, it says that's one farad, that's one farad, that's an ohm, that's an ohm, that's an ohm. And then this RF value is actually 2 minus alpha, right? 2 minus the damping. So what I've drawn is a second order high pass filter. And if I literally use these values of one farad, one ohm, then what I have is something that's tuned to one radian per second. Okay, so the two obvious things are these are crazy values, farads and ohms, and I don't want one radian per second. Okay, I have to do some scaling here. And this is where this equation comes in. Now, for a Butterworth alignment, if you look this up, and there are, um, again, tables in the text, but if you look this up, you will find that the damping for this, for the Butterworth, is square root of 2. It's 1.414. So I can plug that value in here. All right, 2 minus um, 1.414 is going to tell me that RF has to equal 0.586 ohms. Now, and don't worry about the crazy size of it. So just by doing that, we've now improved it to the fact that it's a second-order Butterworth high-pass filter, but it's tuned at 1 radian per second. Okay, Butterworth is the only order, the excuse me, the only alignment that we have where FC and F3 are the same. If you choose a Bessel or one of the Chevy Chevs, there is a little correction factor to go between F3 and FC. We're not going to have to do that in this example, but it's just a single step. You just multiply or divide depending um, to correct this. Now here's the thing. What is the, what is the radian frequency that we want, right? We want 200 hertz. Okay, so what is my omega C for my 200 hertz? Well, it's right, it's 2 pi f for omega, so that's going to be 2 pi times 200 hertz. Right? So 400 pi is roughly 1257 radians per second. What we have is one radian per second. So I basically need to shift this by 1,257. Look at this equation. I want F to go up by a factor of 1,257. I can do that by dropping either R or C by a similar amount. All right, that'll drive F up. So do I pick the caps or do I pick the resistors? And by the way, I'm only referring to these four. These are the tuning elements, right? It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Uh, I'm going to use the resistors for one simple reason. One unity for the caps is very convenient. It's easy to get weird sized resistors. You know, if you look at 1% tolerance resistors, in one decade, there's 96 standard values. So it's easy to get, you know, weird numbers, get something close. So for the caps, I'm just going to leave those at unity. And I'm going to drive down the value of uh, the resistor 
right, to drive up the value of the frequency. So this is what I call the frequency scale. So I'll take ours, my 1 ohms, and I'll divide them by 1,257. So what I wind up with, right, 1 over 1,257 ohms, is uh, 796 micro ohms. <laughs> or if you prefer, uh, maybe it doesn't look quite so damaging if you call it 796 milli ohms. How's that? Okay, well, don't worry about that, like I said. So that's um, going to be 796 uh, micro, 796 micro, this one. Um, we're going to touch these later. These don't get shifted for the F scale, right? Remember, this is setting up the damping. It's these four, okay? All right. So if I now say 1 farad, 1 farad, 0.796 milliohms, 0.796 milliohms, 1 ohm, 0.586 ohms, on paper, I have what I want. In other words, I have a 200 hertz high pass second order Butterworth filter. It is, of course, completely impractical, right? You, know, you call up a distributor and say, I want a 0.796 milliohm resistor to go with my one farad capacitors, and people are going to look at you like, you know, you got six heads, okay? So the second thing we do is a Z scale, an impedance scale. And again, it's this equation. So these caps are too big, and these resistors are too small. So what I do is I increase the resistor and decrease the capacitor by the same factor and that will keep the critical frequency the same right if i increase the resistance by a thousand and decrease the capacitor by a thousand f doesn't move right they cancel each other out so i just have to come up with something that's reasonable you know what's what's a nice number okay well, you know, you look at this and go, well, you know, if I used a thousand, a factor of a thousand, ten to the third, that would only get me 0.796 ohms. If I use 10 to the sixth, I'd have 796 ohms, which is getting a little bit more realistic. Okay. But, you know, maybe I'll use uh, 10 to the seventh. Okay. So if I use 10 to the seventh, multiply the, uh, the tuning resistors by 10 to the seventh. Right, and you're going to wind up with, write this all out, and uh, you're going to wind up with 7.96 k ohms. Now, at the same time, for the capacitors, you're going to use this 10 to the 10 to the seventh, but now you're going to divide. You're going to take your one farad, and you're going to divide by 10 to the seventh. Okay, so that's going to give you 100 nanofarads. Oh, beautiful. You know, now, we're, now we're talking, right? Reasonable resistor, reasonable capacitor. The only other thing I need to do is scale these. But like I said, these can be scaled independent. You don't have to use 10 to the 7th for these. Right? We just need to create the ratio of 1 to 0.586 to get the appropriate gain and uh, damping factor that uh, we need. Okay. So, you know, what do you want to do? Well, we could make this one, you know, we could go by a factor of 10,000, let's say. So this would become a 10K resistor. And this would become a 5.86K resistor. And bingo, you've got a completed design. We're done. So, you know, this, this first one took a few minutes to do, all right? Because it's all new. But... You know, once you get the hang of this, you can rip through these things really fast. You identify what you need, okay? Find an appropriate template. Then you do your frequency scale. Then you do your Z scale. Boom, you're done, right? So it's like following a recipe, basically. So the practical work is doing this, determining what you actually need for a filter. Then you just find the appropriate thing that you um, would have to, to implement that, basically. Okay. Now, if you do a really high order filter, if you decide to do a you know, fourth, fifth, sixth order filter, you actually are going to need a couple of these, you know, maybe two, three op amps, in which case you will find it's almost like designing three filters because there will be a separate 
damping factor for each one of these blocks that you're going to use. Okay, you could not, this is important to remember, you can't just cascade these. If I made another one of these identical and I just put one right after the other, I do not, N O T, do not have a 200 hertz high pass fourth order Butterworth filter. I have a fourth order filter, but it's not necessarily a Butterworth alignment, nor is it necessarily a 200 hertz. Think of it this way. In this circuit, at 200 hertz, the response is down by 3 decibels. If you have another one, just like it, that's also true. So for the entire system, at 200 hertz, you're down 3, you're down 3, meaning you're actually down 6. So your real 3 dB down point is not 200 hertz anymore. Okay, that's a sort of a common misconception that people have. So if you design, you know, a, a fourth order Butterworth filter, you will have two of these templates, but you're going to find there are dif different damping factors. Okay, so you would go through and you'd have, you know, different values for tuning caps and resistors and so on and so forth. But the system as a whole will get you that fourth order response. Okay, all right. So, you know, it's really just a matter of finding the appropriate templates. And these can get pretty wacky depending on what you want to do. So we're going to look at a couple more examples coming up. And it's time now for a simulation of our design. So here we are in Tina TI. Here is our filter. Got our 100 nanofarad caps, 7.96K. These are what are going to set up our uh, tuning frequency. And then, of course, the ratio of these two resistors setting up the fact that it's a Butterworth filter. And I've just thrown a 20K ohm load out here. Um, not critical. 15 volt power supplies. I've got a nice BiFET op amp, a TL081. Um, let's see what we get. Going to run this from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Log display, amplitude, and phase. Okay. Well, clearly we can see the high pass characteristic on the amplitude here. And if I grab a cursor, we'll be able to move this around. If we get to the flat point, we can see we have about 4 dB as expected, right? Um, if we move this down 3 dB, in other words, a net of plus one, which is right about there. There you go. There's your 200 Hertz critical frequency, right? So 200 Hertz Butterworth, nice flat, smooth response here. Um, like I said, obviously a high pass filter and very quickly we can check what the roll off rate here is. This is a second order filter, so it should be rolling off at 40 dB per decade. And here's 10 hertz, here's 100 hertz, that's a decade. Uh, we can see where we're going here. This is about minus 48 at this point. It's about minus 8 here, so there's your 40 dB in one decade. Beautiful.